Good morning. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 15 this morning. If you have your Bible, you want to turn there with me. Matthew chapter 15. And I'm going to start in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 tells us, Without faith it is impossible to please God. For the one who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we probably should endeavor to have some kind of understanding of what faith is. When it, the Bible talks about faith, and it does so quite a bit, and we talk about faith, and we do so quite a bit, what do we mean by that? What does Scripture mean by that? And obviously, there's a range of ways we could define it and understand it. Some would be more correct than others. We're told that the demons believe, but that's certainly not sufficient. We have evidence that the demons even bow down before Jesus. But their faith, their belief is certainly insufficient. So what kind of faith is Hebrews referring to? What does it mean when it talks about our need to have faith, and without that faith, it is impossible to please God? we should probably seek an answer to that question. So let's see what we can find here in Matthew chapter 15. In this encounter that Jesus and the twelve have with an interesting woman. As we are coming through chapter 15, Jesus is continuing to move around the Sea of Galilee in that area. He is teaching, he is healing, he is doing all of these different things. He has just had an encounter with the Pharisees in the first uh, section of chapter 15, and then he concluded that with a an explana further explanation to the twelve because of their question. And verse 21 of chapter 15 tells us, he went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman came out from that region and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came to him and kept asking him, saying, Send her away, for she is shouting out after us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. But even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, your faith is great. Be it done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. And then Jesus departs from there and moves back toward the Sea of Galilee. This is an interesting section of Scripture here. It raises... A number of questions in my mind, and probably yours as well, I would imagine. What is this doing here in the midst of all the other things that are going on? Because if you take this out and read through, Jesus is moving from place to place. He's going to feed the 5,000, then he's going to feed the 4,000. He's doing healings and miracles over here. He's doing healings and miracles over here. There's a nice flow to what's going on here, and this pops up right here in the middle, and this is... it's. It's interesting, but what's it doing here? And why does Jesus respond the way that he does to her? He refuses to answer her. 
And why does he talk about dogs? This is quite an interesting story here. So let's look into the details a little more and see what we can find here. Jesus moves away from there. He went away and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. So he is moving from around the Sea of Galilee area, which he's been going back and forth across. And now he's moving over toward the coast. Tyre and Sidon were Gentile towns. They were originally Philistine towns along the coast. And that area is now kind of the Tyre and Sidon area. Jesus moves into that area. We don't know if he travels all the way over to the cities proper, but he travels in that direction, up kind of uh, northwest from the Sea of Galilee. This is a Jewish and Gentile area. It's, it's becoming more and more Gentile the farther that direction you go, but there are some Jews in that area. But they come across this woman. Now Jesus is, we're speculating as to why he moves in this direction. Um, it may be that he's trying to get away from the crowds. Everywhere he goes around the Sea of Galilee, the crowds follow him. And he may be just trying to get away to decompress a little bit, to spend a little more quality time with the Twelve. He may be kind of moving out into that area where he is less well-known. Or he may be going here for a specific purpose. Anyway, he's moving in this direction. And they come across this woman. How is she described? She's a woman, she's a Canaanite woman, and she has a demon-possessed daughter. Now, in light of what came right before this, if you back up into the previous section, Jesus has had an encounter, a confrontation with the Pharisees, who are asking why his disciples are doing the th eating without washing their hands. They are making themselves unclean. And this embarks Jesus on this question about clean and unclean. Purity and defilement. And he says, it's not what goes in, it's what comes out that defiles you. And he tells the disciples to leave the Pharisees alone. They're the blind leading the blind. Their ritualism their insistence on these outward appearances has made them defiled before God. Go from there to this woman. You cannot get more defiled than this woman in the eyes of the Jews. And Jesus and the twelve are all Jews. And Matthew's audience is a Jewish audience. So they would read this, and this would pop off the page as defilement. She's a Canaanite. Who are the Canaanites? Back in the Old Testament, the Canaanites were in the, in the promised land. God brings the Jews into the promised land and says, the sin of the Canaanites has become completely full. They need to be wiped out of the land. Because the Jews didn't wipe them out of the land, the Canaanites were the ones who were constantly tempting the Jews into idolatry. The word is synonymous with sinfulness in the Jewish thinking. She's defiled, she's a Gentile, but worse than that, she's a Canaanite. She's the epitome. This is the Sodom and Gomorrah idea. Plus, she's a woman, which in the eyes of, now we've got these 12 Jewish men with Jesus, this would make her kind of further off limits and further defiled. And she has a demon-possessed daughter. Need we say more? Something is terribly wrong if her daughter is demon-possessed. Defilement upon impurity, upon uncleanness, this is it. And so she approaches Jesus because she has a need. Her daughter is demon-possessed. She's obviously familiar with who Jesus is. How do we know this? Because of what she says. Look at what she says. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Now, the word Lord here can have multiple meanings. It has a range of meanings in the time period. It can mean Lord as we use it when we talk to the Lord, God. And it's used that way in Scripture. 
It can also mean sir. It can be a term of respect as we would use to someone in a position of authority or an elder, something like that. Sir. So somewhere on that spectrum, we don't know exactly which way she is using it, but the next thing she says is pretty crystal clear, isn't it? Son of David. She knows who this is she is speaking to. She clearly calls him son of David. That's a Jewish term coming out of the mouth of a Canaanite woman. We've seen the disciples, the twelve who've been with Jesus, who were called by Jesus, struggling with this idea. Who is this? The crowds who observe all the miracles that Jesus has done at times are asking the question, could this be the son of David? The Jewish audience that Jesus has been with have been all over the map on this issue. This is the first person who is really crystal clear about this idea. And who is it? A Canaanite woman with a demon-possessed daughter. This is the height of irony. She says, clearly, Lord, son of David. Wow. The first person to really clearly, adamantly state this truth directly. And how does Jesus respond? He ignores her. He ignores her. He ignores her. Just sit there with that for a minute. Because here's the problem. This is completely uncharacteristic of Jesus, isn't it? Or so we would like to think. When we start to think about this, this is probably just a little bit disturbing. Here comes a woman in desperate need. Jesus, we have seen him have compassion on the people when they haven't even asked him necessarily for anything and certainly haven't expressed this about him. And the first person that really clearly expresses who he is, he ignores. That's uncomfortable. It gets worse, doesn't it? Because in just a minute, he's going to equate her with a dog. Who is this Jesus here? And yet, I would posit for you that this is the Jesus of the book of Matthew. This is the Jesus of the Gospels. And the problem isn't that this is uncharacteristic of Jesus. It's more likely the problem is we've built up a caricature of Jesus that is not biblical. What do I mean by that? We have built up this picture of Jesus that we bring to the text here, and his response here makes us a little uncomfortable because we think of Jesus as the one who says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Who looks up at Zacchaeus in the tree and says, Come down, I'm going to your house today. Now, are those things true? Absolutely. Jesus looks on the people and has compassion on them. Absolutely true. But that is not all that we see about Jesus in the Gospels. But that's the part that we build and draw our picture from. This loving, kind, gentle, welcoming Jesus. Is he those things? Yes, but that's not all that he is. But our caricature picture, our Sunday school picture of the smiling, welcoming Jesus is where we land. And so we come to this text and it's disturbing to see Jesus ignoring this woman and calling her a dog. But I would suggest that this is consistent with the Jesus in the Gospels. 
Because the same Jesus who said, come to me, also said, if you love father and mother or son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy to follow me. He's the same Jesus who said, you must take up your cross and come after me. Is the same Jesus who, when he had a man come to him seeking Jesus and speaking to him, turns out the man is wealthy and Jesus says, here's what you need to do. Sell everything you have, then come follow me. And the man walks away and Jesus doesn't go get him. We need to do away with the caricature of Jesus and embrace the fullness of the Jesus presented in the text. Jesus is compassionate. He does welcome people, but he is also very demanding about what it means to follow him. He's very clear about what kind of faith is necessary to follow him. And here's where I think we've, as we've talked, we've talked a little bit about this before, but we've gone a little bit in the wrong direction with that idea at times. I remember talking to a man a number of years ago, and we were, we were talking about his growing up. I was asking him, you know, how did you come to know the Lord? And he said, well, I grew up in a denominational church, and when I was about 12 or 13, all of the kids went to the Sunday school class and they walked you through this catechism type class. And then when you were done, they marched us all down to the front of the church and said, we're all saved. Because we'd all checked the right box. And we kind of chuckle at that, but there are lots of churches that do the same kind of thing. We hold a vacation Bible school and we tell the kids, Jesus died for you. Jesus loves you. This I know. Sing the songs. Yes. Okay. Anybody want to believe in Jesus? And everybody raises their hands and we go, good, you're all saved. Are they? How would we know? They're just parroting back what they've been told to say. And Jesus says, if you love father and mother or son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy to follow me. That's a pretty high standard. That's a pretty high standard. So probably our caricature of Jesus and our caricature of the idea of faith need a little more scriptural correction. So Jesus ignores the woman the woman who is desperately seeking him. The woman who is correctly stating who he is. And the disciples respond when Jesus doesn't. Send her away. She's shouting after us. Get, do something. Get rid of her. Make her stop. They're disturbed and annoyed. It's always interesting to me to think about the disciples here and what they understand and what they're clueless about. Jesus then answers, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus here emphasizes his mission to the Jews, which is consistent with everything he's done to this point. He's been clear about this. He's come to the house of Israel. He's come to the people of Abraham. When he sent the twelve out several chapters earlier, what did he tell them? Go only to the house of Israel. So he's consistent and he's clear about all of this. Yet we know the Gentiles have always been part of the plan of God. Going all the way back to Genesis 12, to Abraham. In you, all the nations of the earth, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And moving forward, even in Matthew's gospel, Matthew includes two Canaanite women in the genealogy of Jesus at the very beginning. A Roman soldier came to Jesus 
and believed. And Jesus did for him what he wanted. The Magi were in the Christmas story. So it, it's not that Gentiles are excluded. Jesus is consistent that his ministry, his mission is first and foremost to the house of Israel. But he's also clear, as will become more clear as we move forward, that Gentiles are allowed in, that they are included. But he's still resisting this woman. So she continues. She bows down before him, saying, Lord, help me. The word to bow here is the word to worship. It's where we get our word for worship. It's to bow down before, in front of someone. It's, it's a position of humility, of submission, of dependence. And that's what she does. She's come to this place of complete dependence on Jesus. She has a need that only he can meet. And she humbly, in full submission, bows down before him. Her posture is representative of her heart attitude. And how does Jesus respond? It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, he does use the diminutive form of dogs here, little dogs. And we've, we may have mentioned this before, the, the ancients viewed dogs pretty much as scavengers. There were a few wealthy people who had them as pets, not any of the Jews, but some of the Gentiles who had dogs as pets. It's not, not like in our culture today, but there were a few. And so he does use the kind of diminutive little dogs idea here. But any way you take this, this is not a compliment. And she's well aware, being a Canaanite woman, of how the Jews viewed the Canaanites. They viewed them as dogs as unclean, as those outside. But Jesus is not welcoming in his response to her, even as she bows down before him. And she responds, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. She doesn't disagree with him. She doesn't contradict him, but she uses what he says to continue to make her point. Yes, you are right. I am outside. I am a dog. We Gentiles are, we Canaanites are dogs compared to you Jews. You are the ones of the children of Abraham. She understands all that and she goes, she admits and goes along with what he says there. But, she says, even the dogs get the scraps and the crumbs off the table. She's begging. Let me just have the scraps. I'm willing to be a dog under the table if you'll just let me have the crumbs that fall off. Now Jesus responds in a way that we would have thought he would have at the very beginning of all this. Now he says, O oh woman, your faith is great. Be it done for you as you wish. Your faith is great. This is, this is really quite interesting as this develops and the way she and Jesus interact here. Because he keeps putting her off. He keeps pushing her away. And she keeps insisting and persevering and coming back. What are we to do with this? How are we to understand this? this is, it's a quite interesting 
little scenario that develops right here in the midst. Notice that the, he talks about a meal and bread, which is in everything going on around us. The feeding of the 5,000 before this, he's going to feed 4,000 after this, and he talks to the Pharisees about eating etiquette. And then he's going to talk to the, the 12 again about bread. Bread and meals are all over this section. And right here in the midst of this is this woman, and Jesus and the woman are talking about the crumbs. And she's okay, just let me have the crumbs. And finally Jesus says, this is faith. Which I think answers our larger question. What do we mean when we say faith? Or what does the Bible mean when it says faith? Jesus says, this is faith. He calls her faith great. The Pharisees before this have no faith. The disciples repeatedly have little faith. They believe, sort of. She has great faith. What do we do with this? In the section right before this, Jesus confronted and corrected the Pharisees and their ritualism, their outward appearance, their insistence that you do things right outwardly. And Jesus points out, you're doing things correctly outwardly, but inwardly, you're unclean. Inwardly, you're defiled. And that's what matters. It's not what comes into you. It's not what you're doing outwardly that you put into your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. Because what comes out of your mouth reveals what is in your head and what is in your heart. What comes out of this woman? As we've established from the outward appearance, she is as defiled and impure and unclean as you can get. But what comes out of her is something else altogether. The first thing we notice is what comes out of her is that she has a right recognition of who Jesus is. She rightly recognizes who Jesus is. And the New Testament cannot be more clear about this point. You can only come to God, one can only come to God through correct recognition of who Jesus is. Jesus makes it clear that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Right recognition of Jesus is necessary for correct faith. That's the first thing that comes out of her. She calls him Lord. She calls him Son of David. Then what else does she do? The second thing we notice is that she bows down before him. So first we have right recognition, which in contrast to the Pharisees, they have no recognition of who Jesus is. In fact, they accuse him of being all kinds of things except what he really is. Then she bows down before him. An outward expression of what is inwardly a stance of humility, of submission, of complete dependence. Her whole approach to Jesus is one of surrender and dependence. There is nowhere else I can go. I am completely dependent upon you to meet this need. And she comes to Jesus. Contrast this with a couple of things. We could contrast this with the disciples, the 12, at the feeding of the 5,000, and just after this, the feeding of the 4,000. In both cases, they don't look in this way to Jesus to meet the need. They're looking at the basket. What do we have? We've got a couple of loaves and some fish. This is impossible. The woman would have taken that and just bowed before Jesus and said, do what you want. Complete dependence. Contrast this with, say, Naaman in the Old Testament. Do you remember this story? 2 Kings chapter 5. 
Naaman is an Aramean. He's a, he's a powerful and, and wealthy uh, general and servant of the king. His servant says, you have leprosy. I know a man who can heal you. And so they, off they go to Israel to find Elisha. And they get there, and Elisha won't even come out to see him. He sends his servant out to say, tell Naaman to go dip himself in the Jordan River seven times. Naaman is furious. How dare he not come out to see me? You know who I am? And you send your servant out here to tell me to go dip in the river, this puny Jordan River? I, you want rivers? There are rivers in my land. This is a creek. And off he goes. He came with leprosy. He's leaving with leprosy. Why? Pride. Pure and simple. Pride. He will not submit to the prophet of God. He just won't do it. He refuses. Which is ridiculous, isn't it? You have leprosy. You came here to get healed. And you're going to allow your pride to keep you from healing. Finally, his servant comes up to him and says, if, if the man of God had told you to do anything, any great impossible task, would you have done it? To be healed? He told you to go dip yourself in the river seven times. Naaman finally overcomes his pride, dips himself in the river seven times, and he's healed. Pride almost kept him from being healed. This woman has no pride. She is completely submissive in all humility and dependence upon Jesus, recognizing him for who he is. This is part of biblical faith. And then finally we see she is persistent, she is persevering in her faith. Which is a biblical idea of faith as well. If we go to Luke chapter 11 or chapter 18, Jesus tells parables that aren't recorded in Matthew. One of the, the man who has friends come in from out of town, so he runs over to his neighbors, knocks on the door, I don't have any food, can you just lend me some bread? I've got neighbors coming, just showed up out of the blue. And the neighbor wants to say no, but because the, he won't leave him alone, finally he gives him some bread. Or the widow who goes before the corrupt judge, pleading her case, and 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 finally the judge says, I don't care about this woman at all, but just to get her to go away, I will give her what she wants. And Jesus concludes, ask, seek, knock. And the verbs there are keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. And you will be answered, you will find, the door will be opened. Persistence in prayer. Which I think is the whole reason Jesus ignores her and puts her off the first several times she approaches him. He's demonstrating to her, but especially to the twelve and to us, what real faith looks like. Because at the end, he says, he points out, she has great faith. Not no faith, like the Pharisees. Not little faith, like you guys. This is what great faith looks like. What does it look like? It rightly recognized the person of Jesus Christ. It adopts a posture of submission and humility, of complete dependence upon him. And it perseveres. It keeps seeking. It keeps asking. It keeps coming again and again and again. It is a persistent, persevering faith. This is biblical faith.
So if we go back to Hebrews 11, without faith, without this faith, it is impossible to please God. Because those who come to God must believe that he is, not in the way the demons do, not in the way that loves something else more than him. If we are called to, if Jesus sums up all the law and the prophets and love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. Is that what he said? No. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and mind. Because without this kind of faith, it is impossible to please God. If we're going to come to God, we must believe that he is. Not just that he exists, but that he is. Like this woman does. She comes to Jesus believing that he is. That he is the son of David. That he is able to heal her daughter. And that if she will persist in it long enough, that he will agree to meet her need. This is biblical faith. We probably need to let go of our caricatures of who Jesus is and our caricatures of what faith looks like and align ourselves with this Canaanite woman with a demon-possessed daughter who displays what great faith really is. Let's pray together. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For the one who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. May we, Father, adopt the stance, the attitude, and the heart and mind that this woman, this unnamed Canaanite woman, demonstrates so clearly here in Scripture. An attitude of complete submission, of unreserved and unresigned humility and total dependence upon you. With a better understanding of Jesus' words that apart from you, we can do nothing. So that we might live a life of faith, that we might pray with faith, that we might serve in faith. That we might be those of whom you would say, this one has great faith. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.